Thanks for coming out, everybody, tonight. Welcome to the Warrant Committee. Um, we are going to start with the approval of the minutes. I'd entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve the minutes for the, what's the 20th? Yep. Second. Second. All those in favor? Any opposed? And just those people who weren't here abstained. Great, thanks so much. All right, well, tonight we're going to be discussing many, many town budgets. Uh, we have a whole group of folks here tonight um, to go over a bunch of them. And we're going to start with the clerk's budgets. So if folks want to open up, and um, Ted, if you wouldn't mind putting on the screen the town clerk budget, uh, and then we'll go to the town clerk election and registration budget. And I must say, Susan, that of all of the narr narratives that I received, yours is one of my favorites. You do a really good job at the narrative. Thank you. <laughs> Actually I have, delineating I have to say what went up, what went down, and what. Tremendous. <laughs> oh, great. Well, Amy, your narratives were good, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's a collective effort. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, in the town clerk budget, there are a couple of lines that went up, uh, professional services, meeting expenses, and mailing. Um, mailing just goes up in the contingent budget, not in the non-contingent. And I'm wondering if you want to open with a couple of remarks and just maybe touch on those few points that are different from last year. Right. So um, in order to make the um, contingent, just get to the right page. In order to make the non-contingent budget um, reflective, I needed to absorb some of the, the costs. So um, it, to do so, I took um, 500 out of meeting yeah. expenses and 600 out of uh, office supplies. Susan, hold on one second. What were you going to say, Ted? So real briefly. I noticed you did that, and I was wondering why. And I discovered the reason that you had done that to keep the budget level was because your your equipment maintenance contracts went up a thousand dollars. Right. Okay. Right. The I whole, have the whole. So the whole reason we wanted you to isolate your maintenance contracts was so that you wouldn't, if they happen to go up, uh -huh. you don't have to level your total general expenses oh. by by taking those amounts out, oh, okay. okay? The whole reason for isolating contracts is so that they can be protected and that you don't have to sacrifice something else if beyond your control they are going up. Oh, okay, okay, so, I'm sorry, I thought. So that's, that's all right, um, <laughs> but so that may be, but, but then of course then the question is, well, what happened with your equipment maintenance contracts that they would go up from 1,000 to 2,000? So that would be the flip well, side of that. So, some of them I was still keeping. Some of them were kind of a split between elections and what we use for the town clerk. So I was basically breaking them up. So I never put them down below in the contracts. And so when trying to separate the two, Mm -hmm. I then I had them all to together. Right. I, I uh -huh. So some of them had been buried in not buried. Or not I I would take half out of elections and registration, half out of town clerk gen you know, one of the other accounts. On, on the maintenance contract. On the maintenance contract. But I hadn't put them under maintenance contracts in 2016 because I was splitting them and I didn't really know how to figure that out. So. Ah, okay. So it goes back, my mistake, <laughs> to last fiscal year. If, if, can I just sure. I think um, what Susan was attempting to do was to really get a clean town clerk and separate the E&R and since we were doing the other changes with pulling the costs out of town clerk and making it a true E&R budget we felt it would just be easier if the contracts were in one spot than her okay. trying to allocate them between the two so hmm. and that's where we I mean I missed that I made you absorb the thousand but I think in hindsight 
Right, and so mm -hmm. therefore, because I hadn't been, I was accounting for it up above. Okay. Makes sense. No, that's, that's fine. I just didn't think you needed to. And you but. probably didn't. <laughs> and I, and I thank probably you. steered her to do that, <laughs> not realizing it. Okay. No, I think, it's, I think it's pretty plain if you look at each budget what happened. Uh, and there are three budgets involved. The, the town clerk's budget, which divested itself of any election and registration expense and gave that to election and registration. Um, and then the election and registration budget, which took on costs from, took on about 20000 in costs from the town's um, clerk's budget, but also got rid of the warrant committee, the, the, war the printing costs and mailing costs for the, warrant, for the warrants, uh, and put them into town reports. So, so that's where, what happened with those three budgets. And I think, it, I think it's great because now elections and registration is a really rational budget. It's just based on what elections are we having and what are the costs <laughs> of those elections. And, and it's just a bill for those elections. And you don't, as long as it's prepared based on the elections, then it's, it's not an issue. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very pleased you did that. And it, and, Couldn't have done it, it without Amy. Well, oh, yeah. anyway, it makes a, makes a lot of sense. Well, I think going so. forward also, you will see the town clerk's budget with less fluctuation because there was some E&R in there right. in the past. It was hard to level it out. This way, why, by us bringing because in the, the fixed contractual cost. Yeah, the, the E&R one will swing quite a bit depending upon the number of elections. But town clerk should pretty much be a little bit easier to understand now from year to year. There shouldn't be huge swings. Thanks, Thanks for doing that. Um, Susan, do you want to touch on the $15,000 request for the preservation? Sure. So um, I did also put the uh, put through a capital equip, uh, capital request for this same thing. Um, wasn't sure it could be bonded, so that's pretty much why I did it in both. Um, but I had an evaluation done of all our records, um, and going from our oldest to our current. Um, the, let me start off by saying the current records, the way they're preserved, should last 300 plus years. Um, the type of paper and the method in which they are preserved, um, they should withstand a good test of time. That's not to say that some of the records that we have have withstood a great um, test of time. However, a lot of them are <laughs> in jeopardy of not being able to um, keep their value. So um, I felt it was incumbent upon me to at least bring it to your attention that um, we, we should look at preserving our records. Um, I brought down a sample of one of the, the records that I have. Um, if you want to take a look at it. Um, it actually, um, to preserve that particular record, mm -hmm. it would cost us approximately <laughs> Thanks, Holly. It came over a little later. Um, approximately $25,000. Um, and so they would break it up into two volumes. Um, first, they clean the paper um, using. 2,500? 100. 100. I'm 100. sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I was thinking. Okay, you can read back. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Come around and see. I was going to say, um, gonna say everybody stop touching that. It's that. okay. <laughs> you're, you're the clerk, not the treasurer. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why I need <laughs> you with me. Um, so it would entail, you know, cleaning it, um, preserving it in a special, they call it mylar um, plastic, which uh -huh. it, like, 
coats the whole entire Excuse piece me. of paper. We had it done um, prior to my coming on on one of the, one of the books. Okay. Um, so that I brought down a sample of how nicely it came out. Um, Amy, do you have a, an opinion on where this sh charge should be? Should it be yes. 150 in the capital, or should it be 15 over 10 years in the well, operating budgets? So Susan and I talked about this at great length, and I requested that she put it in both, that she include it in her contingent budget, because I felt that um, if you look at her plan, it's a 10-year plan, $15,000 a year over 10 years to get to the 150. Um, we weren't sure if it was really the kind of thing that um, should or could be bonded. Um, it's if it were the 150 or the 15,000, either way, it would fall and should be looked at by the um, capital committee, which that capital committee did do that. Unfortunately, we couldn't, um, in order to fund a lot of the priorities, we couldn't afford to do the full 150. Mm -hmm. That's why I felt it would be in the town's best interest if Susan included it in both places because in a contingent scenario at least she'd have the possibility to build it into her operating budget so that she could do the older books that she needs to the 150 and still have s some funding in her budget to continue on a go forward basis with the newer ones to make sure they're done properly so that 100 years from now someone's not looking at books and I understand she is doing that, but just to ensure that there is money there. And in the event that it does get put forward in a potential override and um, that is voted by town meeting and, and the voters, then the capital committee wouldn't look at it again is kind of my feeling on it. So but, if um, we have a non-contingent budget for fiscal year 17, mm -hmm your preference would be to keep it in the capital request? Well, so it's that it already been approved in the capital request for $15,000. But if it, so if there's a non-contingent and the article for capital gets approved by the warrant committee as well as town meeting, she'll at least get to do one year of it. Right. And then if the contingent budget doesn't move forward or doesn't get approved, she still can get some of the older records done and then we, it'll still be in the capital plan. Mm -hmm for us to look at again next year. So I felt it was one of those very few instances where it, it would be reasonable to have it in both places. But if um, the cap, if the contingent budget is approved, would you want to keep the 15,000? Yes. So then we would get two years mm -hmm. done in the first year, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yes. Um, Darnell had a question too. I guess it will dovetail into this as well. When you did the research on the, the, the scope of this whole job and getting it done and broke it down into the 10 years. How is the pricing on this broken down? If we went from, like say 15 to 20, is it, if we bring a bigger initial stack of records there, will we get a better bang for our buck? Or is it just they, that they, the way you cut it up, it's going to end up being that way? So how I looked at it, they went through the worst of our worst records and gave me prices on those. Um, there's about 90 odd books. Um, they looked at about um, about 30 books and gave me prices. So it's basically looking at each individual book and determining what the condition is. They have a certain grading um, and what it would require to, to restore it. Um, not all of our books are in that same condition. Not all of them would require the Mila. Um, treatment. Some of them can just simply be cleaned and rebound, um, and they will be preserved. So it really it varies and fluctuates from book to book. So my suggestion would be to not say that the request is in both budgets, but to say that there's a year request in one budget and a year request in another budget, okay. so that especially for town meeting discussion mm -hmm. purposes, people don't think that we're accidentally including the same single year request in both okay. budgets. But I'll try, to, I'll try to note that in the comment, but just a way for us to talk yeah, about it's, it. Yeah, it's two different phases, right. I guess. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Phil, did you have a question? Yeah, how many, how many of those books would be covered with this 10-year plan? So I believe all 90. All 90. Yes. And do we have any idea whether it would continue to cost 15 grand a year after that to I, keep the current I don't books believe in? so because the, the the way that the books are the paper that we print them the 
um, certificates on now is a better quality of paper back than what, what they had then. So um, they guarantee it, the paper, um, for 300 years. So it, it should. Let, let them worry about it in 250 years. I guess my, my concern would be then to, this would be a permanent override, and yet the need is not necessarily permanent at the level that we would be funding it under an override scenario. You'd be getting, we'd be getting $15,000 for that. So Keep in mind, too, that's her override request, which still yeah. would need to be scrutinized. So it's not necessarily if we do go forward with an override that that would be fully funded or recommended for fully funding. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, how, how many could they do in a year? So they just gave if you me had, the if, if you had money for all 90, would you be able to do it in one year? I don't know if they have the, the manpower to, to do it all in, yeah. all in one year. Um, that question I never a actually asked. Okay. Usually what they will do is um, take, take a book. We'll, of course, take copies here. Then they'll take the book, preserve it. If we needed actually something physically out of that book, we could request it from them. And it takes you know several months for them to, to pro depending upon the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to, to clean it, so they wouldn't take a whole stack at, at, at once. I wouldn't want them to take a whole stack yeah. at once. Okay. Does anybody else have any other budget questions for the town clerk budget? I just wanted to add also that there aren't a lot of companies that do this. No, there aren't. So it's not like we can, you know, we can mm. play with the figures. Right. This, this is the only company in the New England area that, that does wow. do this. Great. Should we move on to the election and registration budget? This one seemed very straightforward to me. I don't actually have any questions or concerns. Um, Susan, did you, do you have any introductory comments that you want to make beyond uh, what we said earlier about what was moved in and out in order to make this a transparent budget? Um, just that, you know, working with Anne-Marie and Amy on this has been very informative for me, <laughs> first of all. Um, and they have been a joy and a pleasure to work with. They are very hardworking individuals, and I appreciate everything that they've done. Good. Thank you. I would um, like to echo that, if I could, Lee Michael. Sure. Um, I, I think it shows another great partnership between mm -hmm. departments where we work together and we try to streamline the processes to make it more effective and efficient. And by putting these two budgets together in one budget going forward, I think you'll have a better apples to apples comparison of what your election and registrations really cost you. Thank you. And I want to thank Amy and Susan for making this happen. <laughs> Darnell, you had a question? Do we have any um, special elections on the upcoming site right now? I'm sorry, do we, we have, have any other special elections that you might foresee? I know we got, you know. We have all the primaries and presidentials and all that stuff. Well, Do we have if, anything else coming if, up? If an override is um, presented, then that we would need a, a special election, and that would, I believe, take place in June, before the before the new fiscal year. So we'd have to squeeze it in. Well, nothing else up on that we know Well, of. we did um, pass the um, the three to five selectmen. So um, when that is. And it would be up to the selectmen whether or not it goes on the ballot um, for next year or whether it would require a special election if it's not here in time. But uh, as far as you know, that hasn't been approved yet by the general court, right? Okay. No. Did you have another, a different question? No, it's just you can't predict <laughs> if, if you need a special election. I mean, if you have... <coughs> The unfortunate demise of a state officer. You know, that's what happens. And I think that, that the, the language in that article specifically stated the next election, that it would be included on the ballot, not necessarily a special election. Right. Okay. Um, Jonathan, you had a question? No, I actually like, covered it. Uh, the, the, um, you're providing the, the funding is here for the elections that we know about, but there is always a possibility of the be others and yep there is just want the committee to be clear that just got one thing not being able to predict the future there may be um call for 
money is transferred from reserve. Right, to and to you know the presidential um, election is going to present an awful lot of challenges. Um, we are going to have early voting here in the state of Massachusetts, and um, with that comes a lot of requirements. All the policies haven't been set and given to us yet by the state. Um, one that I am aware of, we have to offer 10 days prior to the election um, to all voters. How many people that will be, I have no idea. Um, and, you know, when you're talking those larger volumes, it's going to require additional staff, um, additional overtime. And I gave you my best educated mm -hmm. guess mm -hmm. on that, but um, I cannot predict right. what, what that will be. You know, it's a moving target. Ted, you had a question? Well, just a comment. Um, in your budget for the election and registration um, department, there is a wonderful election calendar. There is a breakdown into cost by election. And the most helpful part is Schedule E. It will show you that 24,000 was reclassed to town reports. 19,000 came in from the town clerk, and therefore you have a new total for your general expenses. So it's a really nice job. Yep, very clear. Any last questions for Susan? I just want to say I think they did a marvelous job. We put a lot of work into it and made it very clear for us to understand. And really appreciate it. And I appreciate Jean and Jonathan coming in and speaking to me prior to this meeting to go over it. And it was very helpful to me. Thanks, Susan. Have a good night. You too. Tom, you want to come up and join us? Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. and Amy, do you have a preference for how we handle the budgets? Do you want to just run down them alphabetically? Or yes, do you that's have a, fine. Okay. So then maybe start with town report. Because it ties into these. Yeah. Okay. So we'll start with town report. Which is a very clear budget, I think. <laughs> yes. What'd you say? Bill. It's a bill. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and as we talked about earlier, okay, what we did oh, was we moved the warrants, the printing, um, and the postage for the warrants and the advertising into this town report budget from the selectmen's ENR budget. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I thought that was really clear. Did, does anybody have any questions about the town reports budget? No. Or concerns. All right. Back to audit then? Yes. Problem? No. No, I'm so all set. Okay. Just wondering how much a special town meeting costs in terms of warrant. Right. Well, I guess we can look at the bill. <laughs> the, bill, the February bill. I will printing cost. Is the cost of, um, it's the printing. It's the mailing. Yep. Yeah. Um, Special it's the details. Advertising. It's the details. Okay. It depends on the size of the warrant. Yeah. How many pages are in the warrant? So I can get that information to you because the warrant has been printed. So we should be uh, receiving the bill in the not too distant future. So. Okay. Great. Because you might need a reserve fund transfer for it, because I'm not sure we planned on it this year. No. Did not. Right. No. Great. Well, if you wouldn't mind letting us know when it comes. <laughs> that would be I will helpful. do that. Thank I you will so email much. You. <laughs> um, all right. So, Amy, I think audit is yours, right? Yes. And again, Amy does great narratives as well. So uh, do you want to hit the highlights here and maybe mention the contract that um, I think we're going out on? Yeah, so um, the contract that the existing contract with Powers and Sullivan expired with the um, FY, the last one that we just had, FY15 audit, which was performed in FY16. So when doing the budget for the audit for FY17, we didn't have a contract in place. So at that time, I, you know, contacted the current audit firm through email just saying if we were to um, go forward with an extension, approximately what would the fees be? And at that time, they said that they would keep them level with prior years. <coughs> and then we um, 
did get a one-year extension. The Board of Selectmen um, approved a one-year extension, and they did keep the, the audit fee um, level with FY16 at 58200 um, but the new thing that's coming in now is $5,000 additional for the GASB 67-68 portion of the audit work, which is new requirements. So when you look at the comparison from FY16 to FY17, FY16 had just the regular financial statement audit um, at 58-2 plus another $8,000 for GASB 45, which is the valuation on the OPED liability. That's done every two years, so that cycles off in FY17, and the $5,000 that um, was not included in the FY16 comes in. So it decreased slightly by $3,000, even though there was 8000 coming off and five coming in. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. It's fine. <laughs> so that 8000 <laughs> will pop up every other year. Yep, and that was clear in your comments, too, so thank you. You know, the other thing you might want to add, Amy, is... Um, the, the newly formed audit, audit, well, yet to be formed, but uh, uh, audit committee was supposed to uh, actually select, do the auditor selection, you know, review and selection of the auditor. But since that committee has not been formed yet, uh, and we had to do something, uh, so we did a one-year extension with a, a, an additional one-year option. Was that what yeah, it was? Two-year uh, two two year option. option in the event that <laughs> the audit committee still isn't in place by next fall, which is really Well, for that matter, if the audit committee is in place, they can they, they could exercise that option right. if they'd mm -hmm. like to. You know, to give them the option or to give them enough time because really the audit finishes up in September, but <coughs> um, the new audit starts like in April. So mm -hmm. there's a short window in the fall when you really should start reaching out and getting quotes and bids. So Okay. Um, I can also tell you, too, that uh, GASB 45 and OPEB, is changing to be the same as GASB 68. Uh, so you will expect an additional because it's the same requirements. Uh, there'll be an annual something that's going to have to be done um, to, to roll that every single year. Um, what's, what was happening before, uh, GASB 68 is a pension. It is an unfunded pension liability. You know, every town has one. It was never actually on the books as a liability. It's always been in footnote disclosure. Um, this, among other things, you know, significantly expanding the footnote disclosure uh, and changing some of the technical aspects of how you value the liability requires the entire unfunded liability to come on the balance sheet as a liability. Um, GASB 45 had a 30-year amortization of that unfunded liability. Uh, when the new, it's 76, 75, I forget what GASB it is, uh, will require the same thing for OPEP. The entire liability will come on. So, okay. A lot more liabilities, a lot less fund balance on the yeah. regular financial statements. Um, the question, Ted? Yeah, I'm just wondering. The audit committee was passed two years ago in the fall, fall of 2013. Mm -hmm. um, is there some way this can be be accomplished before another two years go by? I mean, I, I hope so. It's it's a it's a moderator appointed it's committee. Moderator so it's not a selectman appointed committee, um, but it's going to be a difficult committee to fill because of the requirement that it be <laughs> you know people that have strong financial backgrounds to fill it, and and those are typically people who also don't have a lot of time. And, you know, it, but there would be a number of them living in Milton. Oh, they probably are. They probably are. Um, you know, be, <laughs> yeah, no question there are. Um, I don't know where the moderator stands at this point in terms of, I know he's been doing some outreach, but. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions on the audit budget? All right. Central Business Office. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Amy, do you have some opening comments about this? There's a very brief narrative for this one. Yeah, um, basically the contingent and non-contingent requests are the same. I'm not asking for anything above um, 
what I currently have other than one step increase for one employee out of um, total of four in my department. Um, she's newly, has only been with the town a couple of years. Everybody else has been here over five, so they're at top step. Um, could you comment on uh, what the encumbrance is on Schedule C, the $11,000? Not actually perfectly clear on how the encumbrances always work. Honestly, I have to look at it because I don't remember. I don't have my encumbrance list with me. Um, do you remember what we did? What that was for? Eleven thousand for sixteen. I think part of it was. Um, was it part of it? The chart of accounts. I'd have to, I can run upstairs after we go to the next one. I don't have my list with me. I okay. honestly forget what I had <laughs> in there, and okay. I don't want to miss quote myself. It was for the um, chat of the council we had to do the stuff, right? Was it? Yes. Are you positive? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it might have, it, it might have been the chart, um, um, chart of account design, new chart of account design to, um, for the new of financial software, but I don't remember if, if I encumbered that or if that's part of the project. Sure. That's why I... You might want to explain what an encumbrance is to Amy. And just... Do you want me to? Yeah. So at, at the um, Thanks. end of the fiscal year, um, we're ca the town is cash-based cash accounting for the way we keep the records upstairs, and then the auditors come in and they do some modified accrual entries at your end. But basically, at the end of the year, if you've ordered something or you've committed to purchase something that you have not yet been invoiced for or you have not yet received for, you can encumber it. Mm -hmm. So it's not considered an accrual because we're not a accrual basis, but if, if you've committed to purchasing that, you can um, encumber the funds at year end so that it basically rolls that piece of your budget over and right. carries it right. forward into the next fiscal year. Right. Thank yeah. you. Um, and I mean, unlike, a, unlike an accounts payable or an accrual, our expenses that were actually incurred within the fiscal year. Yep. These are kind of promised within the fiscal mm -hmm. year, but they Service actually haven't been incurred. Comes yeah. later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. The expense comes in the following year, and the service actually may even come in and the following year. And the service year. comes in the following year, but it's paid with money that was appropriated the previous right. year. Right. And you got so many days for that. It still has to come in within so many days to, mm -hmm. to encumber. Um. Yeah. It. Should be with no. It should be within like sixty days from your end, um, give or take a few. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm I'm usually pretty strict about encumbrances for people too. I require backup proof that they committed to purchase that. I, I mean, as you're probably all aware, all, the town doesn't really use a, um, a formal purchase order system in the event that when we do convert to that after we go live with the new financial software these will be automatic because if you order something you'll be putting in a purchase order right in the system and it will right. create the encumbrance at year end under the current system it's all manual so they have i make them give me either copies of <laughs> everything just to prove to <coughs> them that they truly did order it and then when the invoices come in if they're dated so, so say it's dated July or whatever, they have to tell me it was encumbered, and then um, my accounts payable <laughs> person matches it up. And so mm -hmm. nothing that's not on that list. That's why I say I got to get the list because I can't remember exactly which one <laughs> I encumbered. Um, it has to be exactly strong. on there. <laughs> What's that? I remember we were starting the soft right process. Yeah, I know, but I don't. I think there's something else in that number. All too. right. Well, you can let us know later. Yes. Any other questions on the central <laughs> business office? Um, I'd like love to know that what the progress is on the new financial software package and I was kind of expecting to see the next I mean I know we'll talk to about the capital request right. later but I was kind of so expecting to see part two of the financial software on that so why don't we list. talk about <coughs> capital because that's not okay. my that's not central business but you're putting in the financial software. The software is in IT, is where the 186, or the one, I forget the number, so 160. You, I can talk about it now, but it kind of flows into okay. my capital discussion. So if you'd like me to, I, I certainly can, but. 
Let's, well, let's discuss we'll it when we do the capital. Anything else on central business? No? All right, great. Thank you. I want to jump to general insurance. Emory, I think this is yours, right? Yes. This one also had some encumbrances, which Ted explained to me, but I just thought you might want to address them. I'm going to run up and get the list in case you have any questions. Can you guys hear Anne Marie okay, or do, do we need to use move a microphone Sorry. for her? Is she okay? She has a low voice tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, Emory, do you want to start with some opening comments about the general insurance? Yes, the uh, general insurance budget is about approximately 6.2% increase over fiscal year 16. The majority of the increase um, is due to the um, workers' comp audit. Um, the insurance company hired a new workers' comp audit um, company, and when they came in, they realized that some of our employee classifications were not done correctly for a number of years. So we've kind of made out a little bit on this mm -hmm. audit. Um, some of the DPW workers were classified as clerical workers, but their, their, their job duty risk is much higher than a clerical worker's job duty risk, so they had to be reclassified. In addition, um, the Consolidated Facilities Department, which again is all high classified employees, was never put into the workers' comp calculation. So that increased our workers' comp um, for this year um, by, I believe it was 35 thousand um, dollars so that's really where the bulk of the increase for 17 is going to come in because it's going to increase the cost of workers comp um, for 17 okay I think as you know the insurance general budget is um, calculated on the three prior fiscal years um, the um, workers comp expenses for the three prior fiscal years and our property and casualty for the prior three fiscal years and when I say prior three fiscal years we're in 16 this we're we're doing budgeting for 17 so it's 15 14 and 13 budgets that they are the prior fiscal years that they go on those numbers okay um, my question on the encumbrance the, the way that it was explained to me <laughs> Is that right now two hundred thousand two hundred and forty dollars is encumbered, mm -hmm. and my understanding was that that was to cover the potential for large deductibles that exist within some of the policies. It's it's to cover um, the potential for um, litigation um, that happens um, that is not covered by the town's insurance company. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we have a couple of cases that are pending. Um, that I really can't go into in depth because they're um, confidential. Um, but that's what that um, hold money is for. Um, it's just kind of a, a little pot of money. So when those... Um, so it's for actual cases, cases that you know it's that might claims. happen. It's not, right. it's not a general sort of like, you don't do it every year regardless of what cases are going on. Um, it kind of carries forward from year to year. If it's not completely expended, I carry forward whatever the balance is from year to year, year to year, because I never know if we're going to get another claim. I was um, just wondering why you didn't um, have that as a line item for like potential litigation or something like that, as opposed to handling it as a an encumbrance. Does it give you a benefit to do it that way? Some, some. Yeah, because then it doesn't get hit. So I just. <laughs> 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 it's always kind of hidden until we reformatted our budgets and now you see it. <clears throat> and it's really not something that I talk about those claims, so it's just kind of um, done internally upstairs. Well, okay. the other thing, too, that happens is it, it is a particular savings in this budget. So if you were to move that into a legal, then it's either, it's either spent or, or gone mm -hmm. out of legal. So, right. um, you know, here the same thing. If you didn't encumber it, it's just going to go back into the pot, back into free cash. Yep. Um, you know, right. assuming you have free cash, you never know what that number is going to exactly be. And if you did have, if you did want to build up that legal mm -hmm. fund again, mm -hmm. you'd have to appropriate it again. Right. So this is kind of saving it from that appropriation that, process. That process, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know. I kind of, yeah. Kind of like the idea of appropriating money transparently for the purpose for which it's intended. Um, but, 
Well, if you think of it, it, it really, because it was legitimately factored in insurance costs based upon, you know, best estimates at the time. Mm -hmm. It's it, it just happens to be a savings in the budget that is winding up getting carried forward from year to year. That's all. And and those claims haven't settled out, <coughs> so I would I would want to keep that money there. They're predicated on a couple of claims that we're hoping um, that we don't have to pay, but in the event we do have to pay. That's the money that will pay uh, those claims so with. So this is not hypothetical or, rep or repetitive in no, the least. No, this is no. this is calculated on a couple of, like Ongoing. I said, confidential claims that mm -hmm. I really can't go into in public session. And yeah, and I wouldn't allow her to encumber it if there wasn't a valid. No. Okay, I was just wondering uh, why it was handled behind. that way. Uh, does somebody over here have a question for Emory? No? no, I was just going to restate something. Like that, so. Okay. Other questions for the general insurance budget? No. Can we move to group insurance? Unemployment? Um, Say it again? No, no, my group insurance. <clears throat> so group insurance sees a little bit of an increase under the contingent budget, which I assume is to cover the potential for new employee positions. Well, we, we have some we changed it. We oh. have some good news. We're going to carry the um, non-contingent number as level um, with f fiscal 16 appropriation. Um, we met with our consultant, our insurance consultant, and so far our claims for this year are um, going well, and he feels comfortable with us carrying forward. At this point in time, a level dollar budget for uh, fiscal 17 for the non-contingent. For the contingent budget, we've increased it because if the override does go through and those potential um, new positions get added to budgets, we're, we factored in those positions um, okay. for a family plan under the insurance. Right. Now, the other thing I'd add about the, ins uh, the in group insurance budget is we did adopt um, uh, sections 21 and 22, 22. of um, Mass General Law, or mm -hmm. General Law, uh, 30, 32B. 32B, which allows the town to make plan design changes. We're under moratorium until uh, December 2016 from making any plan design changes, with, which is was entered into with the unions a number of years ago when we made the first set of plan design changes. So we can't make any plan design changes until after that moratorium expires. Um, mm -hmm. But after that, um, adopting these two <coughs> sections of Chapter 32B will allow us to make plan design changes without bargaining them. Um, there is some mitigation funds that have to be paid and things like that, but, um, but we but could make those plan design changes. Would that potentially include the changing of the premium that is paid by the employees? The split? Uh, no, the, the split, split would have to be bargained. Okay. Um, it's just plan design, your co-pays, your doctor's um, right. pharmacy visits, your okay. prescription, um, your what special about, doctor. What about teams. deductibles? That's plan yes, design. That's plan design. That could affect premium, too. Well, it premium, but not mm -hmm. premium split. In other no, words, no, 80-20. Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. The 80-20 the, the does anything different than 80-20 would, would have to be bargained. Okay. Ted? Yeah, quickly, does plan design also include the, the uh, carrier? I mean, if, if people are expecting Blue Cross Blue Shield coverage, or it could, yes, it, it might be Harvard Pilgrim now. No, no you would have to negotiate if you're going to change their insurance company. Okay. Plan design just changes the um, design of the current plan that you have within. So right now under we have the auspices Harvard, of Blue Cross Blue we Shield. We have Harvard Pilgrim and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Okay, so. The $275,000 differential between the level and, uh, well, contingent and non-contingent is based on the potential of all the positions being filled yes. and then a fa all of them electing family plan. Well, what is the family no. plan well, it runs? It's, it's not the fault. It's, it's 15. 80. We're, we're, we're yeah, we're only doing 15. Like 15 of all the new hires will enroll in insurance and we estimated it on the conservative side at family plans because that's what a lot of the people do and a lot of 
So it's approximately 15 new hires at the 80%, which is about 18,000. <coughs> is that about uh, is that about nine from the schools and six from the town? No. No, those were town side positions. Those are all town side positions? Yes. Acknowledging that if we added them all together, more than likely not yeah. every single oh, right. hire would take five from the library. Yes, right. I'm sorry. But we're not. <laughs> okay. We're not. Sorry. We're not. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. exactly. Okay. So <laughs> the schools aren't factored into the fifteen. Right. But we know that we're not the library uh, positions of five new positions probably won't happen in a contingent budget. So right. again, we just took a number of fifteen because okay. we felt comfortable with that number, um, given all of the new positions that have been requested. And, um, and things fluctuate anyway. Mm -hmm. <coughs> right. mm -hmm. You always have to have a question. Um, the other thing I can tell you, too, is because you asked the question of uh, different insurance carriers. And I can tell you from, from my, my own experience, having to negotiate with my own company, which insurance carrier, it varies every single year. Sometimes Blue Cross is lower. Sometimes Tufts is lower. Sometimes mm -hmm. Pilgrim's lower. You can never figure out which one's going to be lower in a particular year. You really can't. No, you have to check every year. Yeah. So. so so eliminating Blue Cross wouldn't necessarily eliminate cost. Yeah. Steve, you had a question? I do. Um, on the FY17, the contingent at 11.095 mm -hmm. is the 10, 820 plus 15 new positions potentially. Mm -hmm. So whereas it's, the 17 has dropped down to the 10, uh, 534 should that now be the baseline and so that contingent number comes down that same amount yes it looks okay. like the, the new you have to do a revised budget. Steve, it's yeah it's on the screen the, yeah, no, he's the right. new oh, contingent oh, oh, number okay. is 10809 we haven't done 759 I did it here and the non-contingent mm -hmm. is the same as the appropriation for 16 okay. yeah this okay. has to be 10534 Sorry. Okay. So so get rid of get rid of eleven oh nine five and replace it with ten eight oh nine seven five nine. Ten eight twenty. Ten eight twenty? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Ten million eight twenty. Now the other thing we're concerned about with group insurance too, looking at into the future a little bit, is uh something that Obamacare is still with us in FY twenty, the Cadillac tax back. kicks in at FY twenty. Um, we're not at it yet, but depending upon premium growth compared to, um, you know, the, the modest inflation growth they have in the Cadillac tax rate um, mm -hmm. or premium number, um, you could well wind up in it in a few years. Yep. So that's where plan design is going to come in. Amy? Keep, keep us out of that situation. Yeah, because uh, it's an onerous know. tax. Mm -hmm. Should the number now be ten million eight hundred and twenty thousand seven hundred fifty nine dollars, or is no. it three zeros at the end? No, three zeros. At okay, the end. three zeros at the end. Thank you. Other questions for group insurance? All right. How about law? <coughs> See, we're getting an increase here. Yes, I, I believe you have the <laughs> engagement letter from the. Uh, Murphy has to turn me in the hand. We have the what letter? Engagement letter. Mm -hmm. It was attached to your budget. No. Um, I just have your um, no, narrative. No, we have a narrative. No engagement letter. What is an engagement letter? It's um, Murphy has to turn me in the hand's engagement letter, which talks about uh, the fee increases for the fiscal year. I apologize. I thought it was on the back of your budget. I will get it to you tomorrow. Okay. But those, those fee increases are delineated under special services in your narrative. It's also in my narrative, if yep. that's correct. Okay. But I usually do give you a copy of the engagement letter. Okay, so, so in the um, non-contingent budget, um, we're requesting 350000 and I know that's more than what we requested in fiscal year uh, 2016. However, the Board of Selectmen um, wanted to put some money in the non-contingent and in the contingent for airplane noise mitigation. Um, I really can't go too in depth about what they want to use it for because it's executive session uh, discussions at this time. But um, I think you all are aware of the airplane issues 
impacting the town, and the Board of Selectmen would um, like to make some serious steps in um, mitigating the airplane noise. And so in the non-contingent budget, we've asked for additional monies under the professional services line um, to be able to hire some experts and some legal um, experts in, air that, um, in airplane noise. So respecting that it was done in executive session and you can't go too far into it, the, the number for the contingent budget specifically is pretty big. Yes, and we're, we're, um, our thought is that we will use one-time money for that in both the contingent and the non-contingent, um, not to, uh, to minimize the impact on the operating budget. Ted? Yeah, how, how soon are we going to know how much of that 450000 which is 200 and 53,000 more than last year is is actually going to be consumed within a one within fiscal year 17. Do, are we going to have a pretty good guess? No. At no. some point? No. 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 You, you, you're talking. You're talking about the federal government. You're talking about a very complex issue. You're talking about something going for years. So no, there's no way to determine it. So this is likely to turn into another of those encumbered situations. <laughs> Where the only way you can have it is if, 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 if a case actually existed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of the encumbering. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're, exists. We're, um, we're putting it away in case and then... Well, the board feels this is one of the most important projects going forward and they want to have some money to avail themselves of hiring experts in order to tackle the issue. I so mean, the, the other alternative, if, if, not used in, in, if not used in 17, we could potentially put into a special <coughs> purpose stabilization fund. I wonder if it could be put into the TED fund mm -hmm. after 17, mm -hmm. knowing that it was earmarked for that purpose. Mm -hmm. What's the name of the TED fund? Budget Stabilization Fund. <laughs> I, will, I will tell you the five-year average for uh, special and professional services in the law budget is approximately $241,000. That's I, the I didn't five hear what year. You said. I'm sorry. It's okay. It wasn't you. I was writing. Sorry. The five year average mm -hmm. for the special and professional services is about 241,000. Yep. That's your five year average. Right. So last year's actual of 236 is pretty close. Mm hmm. Yep. That's correct. Hmm. It's getting bigger, this budget. Um, but. Uh, I don't have any specific well, as, questions. As the town specific. has more and more society complex, the <laughs> society we live in, more, more complex problems. Um, um, Betty had a question first, and then Steve. This is just about the airplane noise issue. Um, what other communities have sort of done something similar or spent money? Spent from money, Hull specifically. And done well, I mean, and had an outcome that was. Hull's outcome was not well. No. No. They spent approximately $400,000. And nothing really changed or improved. I, I guess you, they they, they saw it, whether it, they did not win the case. Let's put it that way. They saw are they some still mitigation? complaining. I mean, if mm -hmm. I, yes. about how much noise is mm -hmm. down there. Yes. yes. And what about Brookline? I heard that Brookline was able to somehow. I change. You know, or people shift. say yes. I've heard other people say no. there, there was no litigation. There never has been any. So I don't know what to believe. To be perfectly honest, I don't know. We have we have town council looking into that. At this time, it's just sort of concerning that we're putting, you know, a good amount of money mm -hmm. into this process when you have really no history of, of um, other people doing something similar and having any success. I mean, like, just, I, I can understand why we need to do something because there seems to be a groundswell of. Oh, I, I, I from listen. I understand. There are that. some things that we can do at the local level, but I agree with you. It's more the federal mm -hmm. um, level that they have to get involved in, and, and until they, um, our federal legislators get involved and, and really kind of take on the FAA. Um, we could potentially discuss that with the selectmen the the possibility of taking that out of there and putting the special purpose stabilization. Because special purpose stabilization, the way that statute is, is the selectmen then have the ability, <coughs> it's approved by town meeting, to go in there. The selectmen have the ability to expend it. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't have to come back for two-thirds vote. But it's in there for a specific purpose. So it can all be spent for that. Mm -hmm. That might make sense. Special purpose. Mm -hmm. um, Steve, you had a question? 
Yeah, a uh, question and a comment. The comment the same as I've brought up the last couple of years and with the new engagement letter with the higher rates, it makes me wonder again at what point the town may go out to bid on these services. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's that. Um, the other part is a lot of organizations, when they start to really spend a lot of money on out-of-house counsel, will look toward in-house counsel. And I'm wondering if that's something that's been looked at at all as a potential to take on some of the less complicated things that the town council does for us and get it done less expensively than you know, paying a partner or an associate outside council. I think if you look at the rates, and it, I, don't, I don't recall off the top of my head what they are in the engagement letter, but they're, in, in terms of law firm rates, they're, they're really they're not high. Very reasonable um, rates. Do you have the engagement letter now? Mm-hmm. I mean, whether, whether an in-house counsel will be cheaper or not is, is, is hard to say, but it, it's certainly not like you're paying, you know, big, big Boston firm rates. We have discussed... Requested for fiscal 17, the special services hourly rate is $205 up from $200 an hour, so that's $5 increase. The other special services um, is $220 an hour up from $215 an hour. Um, paralegal services have remained, are going to remain the same, $95 an hour, and the labor service is up um, from $200 an hour to $205 an hour, so an increase of $5 an hour. Steve's point is well taken, though, and, and we, it's a point that we make on all these contracts, and that is that it's good practice to go out to bid occasionally Absolutely. to verify that you have competitive pricing. I think that those, that pricing is competitive just by looking at it, but yeah. um, it's, you know, you have to check the rates every once in a while. Absolutely, right? yes. Right. And the retainer went up from 58000 to 60000 $2,000 $2, increase. I agree, it's a point well taken. Darnell had something? Okay. You're all set? No. Um, Phil. Phil, did you have something? Well, only a comment on the special stabilization fund. The, the, the beauty of that is that it will allow the town to have a discussion about this issue and whether or not the groundswell that some people feel is, exists for it would continue to exist if they had a, an idea of what the potential cost is going to be, at least at the outset of this thing. And the problem with these things is once you expend a certain <coughs> large sum of money and decide to proceed forward, you end up, you tend to want to continue to put money into it to bring it to some sort of resolution rather than dropping it mm -hmm. prematurely. Mm -hmm. So at, at some point fairly early on in the process, we're going to be committing to a lot more money down the road. And funding it, I think, out of an operational budget when it could be a war and it could be years before it's, it's settled is not necessarily the best way to do it. But. Mm. This is now going to become an issue at town meeting where you're going to discuss it, but you're going to be discussing it in terms of the operating budget. operating budget of one <clears throat> one budget as opposed to a town-wide issue mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. needs resolution. Mm -hmm. That's a point. Good point. <clears throat> Darnell? Okay. To um, add on to the end of that, my thing is also is to figure out what we want as an end result and what truly would be an immediation to the problem as it exists. To kind of say, oh, we want to fight, for, but what are we fighting for, is my question. Are we trying to get the planes to fly higher? Are we trying to get them to reroute themselves? What are we actually fighting to make happen? To say we just want to have less noise without, you know, something to dictate or specify? We'll be fighting and spending money forever, and at the end of the day, we'll get tired of spending money <clears throat> we don't even know if we got what we were fighting for. And that would be a nice thing to clarify if we're going to do this. That's a good point. It's a good Jonathan. country Joe and the fish quote. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan? Well, I think what the, the board is hoping to see is more fair and equitable distribution amongst all communities with airplane traffic. Right now we're getting the bulk of it on the fours in the 22L, 33L, and there's some communities, if you look at the maps, that are and no-fly zones. And so I think what the town's um, ultimate goal is is to um, have more communities share the burden of airplane traffic. And how we get there 
that is the discussions that are taking place now in executive session with our attorneys. I mean, there's, there's two discussions. Well, you know, one is obviously the the, the noise complaint. You know, and, um, um, and just in terms of annoyance. Uh, the other one is <coughs> the potential health effect of both noise and just pollutants from planes flying. And has FAA properly studied it or is committed to studying it? Because you know, health impacts is a long, long range look into the forward future uh, kind of study, but um, but has the FAA committed to studying it? Because clearly there's planes up there and they there are particulate matters up there that come out of planes. Are they bad for you? I don't know. No. Um, <laughs> I would guess they are. They're <laughs> probably not good for you. <laughs> the, the key for me is more or less basically if we say we want to reduce the number of flights that pass over Milton, that's a goal. You know, is it is it a reasonable goal? Is it something that we can get if we battle for it? You know, is it that we want to have planes fly high so we don't hear the noise? I mean, just have some stated results yep. or that we can, you know, work with and just say go from there because just to pay money to say oh we want to just get into this fight and whatever they give us or throw whatever bones they throw to us oh we, we spent four hundred thousand whatever amount of money yeah and they threw us a bone and just so we can say we won something mm -hmm. we take it you know i don't want to get caught we, we have in the past put very specific requests into the faa uh in math court that, that, that were very specific in terms of what we're looking for um, okay. Speak about Jonathan, you had a question? <coughs> yeah. Um, the additional money in the non-contingent budget, um, something like uh, $87,000, is, is there a particular plan for how that would be spent? Not or? really, no. It's just a, it's a number. It's a just number pulled out? I mean, I was going to say pulled out of a head. I presume you have some sense of how that was put together, or is it... Uh, I mean, I can see was it 87? I mean, how do you get these? No, uh, I thought it was um, 50 or something. It's like 49,000. Um, the 87 difference is I, I kind of factored the true amount of um, what it costs for um, professional and um, special services, just the cost of those mm -hmm. items. And uh, so, what we're looking to take out of one time money for the non contingent is only 49,000. Okay. Which is the difference between the 284? And the number really is pretty arbitrary. Well, yeah, I, it, it's very easy to well, we're looking go down a rabbit hole on expert witnesses, mm -hmm. uh, you know, potential witnesses at this point, just experts. But the um, uh, I, I would agree with Darnell that it, that that it's certainly a good idea to have a specific goal in mind, but figuring out how you're going to get there and how best to spend mm -hmm. um, the money early on. Mm -hmm. Good luck. Mm -hmm. All right, no, I, I totally understand the grade. It's, it's, it's a complex issue and it's... Could be very open. And it's, and it's a David and Goliath fight too, so mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's both. Anything else on the law budget? Yeah, I would just like to ask if, if you have an an ear uh, of the have the ear of the FAA. I mean, is that when this first started years and years ago, the FAA would slam the phone down. I mean, nobody would even wasn't even open for discussion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so now, is there a is there a? Uh, I think we've made inroads. I, I think the um, uh, when Congressman Lynch and um, Capilano came um, December third was third. Um, yeah, I, I think that opened FAA's eyes a little bit, Massport's eyes a little bit. Um, I think they've been a little more, um, I'll go into the word, but, but just um, have been a I'm little more to. sensitive to, to, to the communities. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, Congressman Lynch came down pretty hard on them, uh, in, you know, in a congressional session. So, uh, you know, they, they know that, Massachusetts means business, you know, because uh, it's not just Milton, it's, yeah, it's I, a number of the other communities, yeah. too, mm -hmm. that, that have similar complaints. So. Okay. Thank you. All right. Personnel board. Personnel board, the um, contingent and non-contingent is a level 
uh, to fiscal 16. The only um, add is the step in lane. Yep. And a modest $1,700 for general expense. And could you just explain why is the assistant town administrator half in this budget and half in? We're supposed to um, give half his time, his or her time to the Board of Selectmen's office, 18.75 hours to the Board of Selectmen, and 18.75 to the Personnel Board. Okay. Now the change that's happening I, there is, is, is we are hiring a full-time HR person. I would like to eventually see this budget go away and then the, the uh, HR director just be uh, vetted into the selectman's budget yep. or become ju just an HR department budget on its own. Okay. Um, questions on the personnel board budget? So yeah, Betty? The, re the HR person might be replacing the t assistant town administrator? No, right, it, we have an assistant town administrator slash HR okay. director, one position, and he served um, Michael Blanchett was currently, uh, who, who was the former assistant town administrator, HR director, just left to go to another Maybe community, so it's vacant at this point. Um, but that, that, this position gives support to the selectman's office and to the personnel board. Um, but if, as you remember, about eight months ago, nine months ago, um, we, we took on a, a five department reorganization, mm -hmm. um, which kind of put streamlined duties and put the duties and the processes in the right departments we felt um, going forward because HR um, is one of my passions and I've for a number of years wanted to create a true HR department and have one-stop shopping for when your new employees come to the town they get a packet with all of the information that in, in one place as opposed to okay you come to this office to get your papers to fill out and then you go to this office and see this person then you have to go to this office and fill out your insurance and then you have to go to this office and fill out your over and then you and in the and so I really felt that um, in today's world we should have a strong HR department with um, real clear training for our department heads our middle managers and our clerical support staff um, because it, HR is constantly evolving um, in, in the um, requirements and the regulations are constantly changing. And I think that, you, you know, by having a strong HR director that really encompasses all of the HR facets helps to alleviate us having some um, potential litigation down the road because we aren't well educated in the HR requirements. Um, so I had created this position about eight months ago. Um, this ties into now your selectman's office. Right. By creating this position that I was passionate about, um, I kept some of the assistant town administrator duties with your town administrator. And um, so when we get to the selectman's budget, I, I'll talk a little bit about that. Right. Mm -hmm. Anything else on the personnel board? Because I, I do have questions on that, but in the selectman's mm -hmm. budget. No? All right, well then, can we move to the selectman budget? <coughs> um, I was going to ask you, Amy, if that position was already approved by the personnel board. No, we'll be going um, February 10th. Uh, for the assistant town administrator position. Okay. So the non-contingent is level dollar, just the increases in the um, steps and lanes and um, longevity. Yeah. Um, the contingent budget, you will notice, has a new position in it. Yeah. And um, I really hope that um, this position comes to fruition. Um, because I think that the Board of Selectmen's office is the top office for the town. It's the hub. It's where everything lands. And I really feel that this department has been understaffed for a long, long time. And um, my fear is, I think, as you all know, I'm re leaving in June, retiring. And um, as the strong town administrator, whoever he or she is, comes on board and, be and has more and more duties um, put upon them, um, they're not going to have the s staff to support what they have to do um, on a day-to-day, month-to-month, year-to-year basis. Um, they, there's two positions in the selectman's office. Um, one is the um, executive secretary, which is the, uh, the support to the board of selectmen, um, and then the contract and licensing agent. These two positions, the people that hold these positions are brand new employees. They both aren't even there a year yet. And now we're going to be bringing in a new assistant town administrator slash HR director. 
So we need to give this new town administrator, whoever he or she is, the tools in order to do the job. <coughs> because I will tell you, you can't do this job in a normal weekly setting. Um, there's too many hours, and, and, it, and it really is not right to have your town administrator sitting creating budgets and doing data entry and writing letters approving vacation carryover, FMLA leaves, and, and just day-to-day -day operations. Your town administrator should be out, should be, you know, thinking about your strategic plan, should be thinking ahead, should be networking, should be uh, thinking about new ideas of how to t bring the town forward. You can't do that because there's not enough time with all the other duties that are put upon your town administrator. Um, okay. And I don't say that from a poor me type of <laughs> um, atmosphere. I say that because I really am passionate about the department really being structured correctly in order for your strong town administrator to be successful. Um. I have other questions, but not a question on that new position. Does anybody else have a question on the new position? Oh. Did you want to add anything Ted? about the new position? No, I think you said it well. I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly needed, and you know, we're clearly understaffed. Um, yeah, this can be judged by the 80 hours a week that you work. Uh, but, um, but, you know, and, and it became so apparent that, um, um, you know, we went to the MMA conference this past weekend, and... Um, you know, you're just listening to, um, you know, Governor Baker speak about, you know, some of the things that he's implemented at mm -hmm. um, the state uh, level, the state and level, and um, and some of the new programs that are out there that, you know, to be perfectly honest, some of them we didn't know anything about. We didn't know anything about because you don't have time to, you know, keep on top and do the research because you're just putting out fires all day long. Mm. Um, yeah, you really do need a, a front person to that town administrator, um, that really controls the flow in the day-to-day -day operation in the office and in the town hall. You know, like for example, there, there are IT grants out there. Didn't know that. Hmm. Ted? Yeah, I don't really have a, a question so much as, as, um, as, I, as I do think as this strong town administrator comes on, that's just one person and, and the duties <coughs> of that office have been enlarged. So it makes sense that they would need some backup there. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I know Anne Marie, you're a workhorse, but you know, um, I think this makes a lot of sense. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Um, thanks, Ted. Oh, Steve was gonna. Steve. Let me just be the devil's advocate and, and throw it out. What What do you say to somebody that says, "Let's give the." five-person select board and the strong town manager um, model sometime to work itself out before we expand the size of that office well first it, it's it's only in the it's it's in the contingent budget but uh, but clearly the the HR position has has grown and grown and um, I think it was eye-opening when we took a look at the condition of like for example, the insurance, the health insurance, mm -hmm. and how much it had been neglected over a period of time. Um, that I mean, how many errors there were in it. There were people. Um, there were people in the plan. The well, I think that um, you can explain okay, some of that. But yeah, um, I think again, it comes down to staffing, and I think the person that was doing health insurance probably didn't have the time to drill it down and do the proper reconciliations, and there were a lot of things that fell through the cracks. But with insurance changing and with the Affordable Care Act coming on, insurance is over fifty percent of of this job right now. Because I'm doing the assistant town administrator job right now, as as well as Amy is assisting me, and we're constantly seeing people coming in looking to change their insurance, you know, add a new baby, uh, d you know, spouses died and they have to change the plan. People that are new hires have 30 days to mm -hmm. opt into the insurance program. There's a lot of paperwork that goes with that. And um, so I, I, to, to, to Mr. McCurdy's um, question, um, I think it only strengthens the argument that you should have another, the, a second assistant town administrator 
if you go to a five-member board because there will be all that much more work to be done even with a five-member board because those five members are going to have their projects that they want this town administrator to work on. And, and I guess if you look at the timing of it too, if, if the position gets approved, the strong town administrator will be in place and will be able to actually hire the person that they want mm -hmm. for that position. So it won't be put in the cart before the horse in, in the sense that we'll have a person on board and, and then bring in the strong town administrator. That's right. um, no, that, that strong town administrator will have, because um, this wouldn't go into effect till July 1st. So they, they'll have the ability to bring in um, and, and appoint that person. Right. To support Ted has them. a question. So uh, can you tell us how many employees and retirees are on the health plan administered? Approximately 870. Total? Yes. And there's 232 retirees. There's two, 318 in the schools and 322 on the town side. So that's a lot. Yes. So it's a big stuff. So it's a service to the schools as well. That's right. Mm -hmm. This, yeah, the HR director doesn't do the day-to-day -day HR for the schools, but handles the insurance for the whole town. That's correct. And we have health. We not only have health insurance, you have um, dental insurance. You have other um, cafeteria plans. Um, you know, we have Aflac. Um, we have Boston Mutual plans. Um, so there's a lot more than just health insurance when you're talking insurance. Yes. Amy, do you have something? I just, I just want to say I've been trying to help Anne Murray since Michael well to the best that I can, and the HR piece <laughs> is absolutely positively a full-time job. That even if you got a person full-time that HR role, if this this um, new position comes on board, it's still not a 37 and a half hour. Week and even me being kind of close to it, I never realized. Thinking, you know, I've been here for five years, I've never changed my insurance. But you don't realize how many teachers come and go, how many instructional aides all of a sudden hit the 20 hours or whatever to become eligible for help. There's so many changes that happen on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't even realize it. And and this is people's like this is important stuff. You can't have that stuff fall through the cracks. You can't have someone. Um, electric a change in coverage and it fall through the cracks or or somebody leave employment and the communication not happen that they need to come off the bill things like that there's so much work in this area that that I just that alone is is almost full-time just the mm -hmm. insurance piece and like Emory said there's optional life there's you know AFLAP plans that you know accidental coverage and, and things like that that there's so many pieces to the puzzle that until you dive in and look at it I, I went to her after a week and I said oh my goodness the the sheer volume of calls and emails and people dropping things off I don't think either one of us realized how much change happens on a weekly basis um, to people's coverage it's just mm -hmm. incredible the amount of things and and we're putting new processes in place um, because we've been doing it for the last month, a little over a month now, and we've seen um, some of the um, issues that have fallen through the cracks. So Amy and I are working on um, putting some proper procedures in place so that when we do get this new uh, HI director on board that they will embrace these changes and hopefully it will um, streamline the reconciliation going forward as well. Okay. Which will also clear one of the management letter comments. Uh, it, small dollar observation, but um, if the board of selectmen is expanded from three to five, mm -hmm. we would need to include new stipends, I assume, for those. You would, yeah. New boards of board of selectmen members. You would. When would we hope but to have? But they probably wouldn't. You wouldn't have the election till probably seventeen. So that would probably be eighteen that it would happen in. Yeah. It would be 18. Dates will work. It would be 18 before. Leave a note for somebody to inc yeah. to put that in in the <laughs> FY18 request. You may have to come for an RFT. <laughs> Expect it. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Any other questions or comments on the selectman budget? Unemployment. Okay, Amy, do you want to take unemployment? Sure. Give me a list. 
So unemployment <coughs> historically has been submitted at $100,000 a year. Um, the contingent request is at $100,000. The non-contingent request has been increased to $150,000 under the assumption that in the event um, an override does not pass, that there will be um, some major layoffs and that will increase the unemployment claims. Uh, in your comment, you noted that um, we had come in sort of over budget for a couple of years, mm -hmm. um, but that we're now we're requesting in FY17 the same amount as in FY16, but you said that you included as the best you could um, sort of a forecast of what you would expect uh, under the contingent budget. I just wanted to make sure that I was understanding your comment correctly. We did go over, but we are requesting the same amount because you don't think that we need any more. Well, we, we did not go over in 2015. Okay. 2015, we turned back um, $38,000. The claims were not um, as high as in previous years. The years when we experienced uh, much higher than the budget were um, those years where the, the claims were extended <coughs> um, okay. to two years, and as that, oh, they added on. The that claim expired, um, the claims started coming down. Mm -hmm. So actually in fiscal 14 and 15, um, fiscal 14 was 79,000 and change, and fiscal 15 was 62,000. Um, so I felt that for the contingent, uh, the non-contingent estimate that a hundred and, I have them backwards in my narrative, by the way. Mm. I don't know if you noticed that, but. Um, for the, the non-contingent budget that $100,000 I felt was a, a good estimate. Um, and, you know, the, the contingent estimate of 150000 is really just a best guess. Best guess. Okay. Questions on unemployment? No, actually, they're correct. No, they're no you haven't right. right. No, they're right. no, correct. We want no, not in my narrative. Yeah, they are. Yeah, the non-contingent right. is 150000 The bottom. The non-contingent. Yeah. Oh. Well. Okay, yeah. It's very confusing. Yeah, because See, you, I you got it wrong in my head tonight. Yeah, you think it's going the other way. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it should be more. Yeah. <laughs> so, never mind. It's the opposite. This the other one way. has been a struggle for me this year, even though in the past it's the big short. easiest one. It's the big short. Backwards. So. Questions on unemployment? Should we talk about the capital? Sure. Sure. Um, did we do all of them? I think that's all the budgets. Are there, are there any that I missed? Do we have no. capital budget? No. I don't think so. That's it. That's it. We don't um, have... Did we not distribute it to you? No. no. That's not helpful. It was never... Sorry about that. Do you have it to put up on the screen? I don't know. I'm trying to think. Yes, I do. No, we never got it. Um... It came out on January 8th, although I think it was sent to us much more recently than that. Right? So, <coughs> when did I go to the Board of Select? Do you remember? <coughs> While we're waiting for the Jeez. file to come up, I'll let you know there's, there's only so. one C in my last name. Oh, <laughs> I'm full of mistakes tonight. Where is that? <laughs> On the CC line. Oh, gotcha. Sorry about that. No problem. I used to do that to Ted all the time, too. Now, I don't know how much uh, Steve has, uh, has explained the, the whole capital committee process, but, um, and, and it's still something that's evolving. Um, actually, Steve is kind of working on some policies and procedures to, be discussing Surprise. in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but w we do have a fairly, what we try and do is we try and project out capital needs over a five year period. Um, pass that one we around. try and decide which of those make sense to bond and which of those do not make sense to bond. The, you know, the <coughs> smaller dollar stuff, the shorter useful life stuff, you know, you try and pay for if you can with, um, with free cash or, or, or other one time money. Uh, and the more expensive and the longer useful life you, you try and get into the bonding schedule. We do have a, a huge spreadsheet that we use that will um, basically predict out. Um, um, so we'll take the spreadsheet, we, we factor in what we believe the interest rates are going to be for the next five years on bonds, what the interest rate on bands are going to be for the next five years, uh, when those bonds are going to be issued. We use. We've been using an, Oct an August issue date for each year. Uh, and 
whether we're going to, from the time they're appropriated, whether, whether we anticipate bonding one year from that point or <coughs> two years from that point, because you can ban up to two years without having to pay down any principal. So all that stuff is factored into that spreadsheet. It's placed on there. Uh, it projects out the debt. It puts it onto a schedule. Um, another spreadsheet that calculates, we try and keep our, our debt service within 1.9% of the tax levy each year. Um, so what, when you're looking at FY15, uh, or I'm sorry, FY17 debt service, uh, you're probably not looking at debt service, well, you definitely are not looking at debt service and any new fixed asset or capital additions. Those, I think, in our plan right now won't hit until FY19, right, because we use the two-year? Um, some, some interest in right. FY17, but so principal it, not until. It looks until like FY19 bonding on them. Uh, just to kind of, and, and the reason for doing that is we were slightly over the 1.9% in FY17 and FY18. So not to exacerbate FY18, um, we made the decision to recommend that anything we put on in 17 uh, would not get bonded, would get banned for two years and, and bonded in uh, FY19 uh, so that that's the first year that we have any debt service impact. So that's kind of the plan that, that happened in putting the whole thing together. Um, and, and like I said, we do use the 1.9% the of, of so, so we factor in on that spreadsheet uh, what, what we expect the, uh, the tax levy to be plus new growth, take 1.9% of that. That's the target debt service number. We look at what our actual debt service is, you know, based upon debt service schedule of existing debt. Uh, we look at the estimated uh, debt that is going to be issued that may not have been issued yet but will be issued that will impact FY17. Right now there was a schedule, I forget how much was on it, but you know, stuff like the, um, um, well not the fire station because it's paid for with other things, but there, there were some surface grains. There, there were a bunch of things that are coming up and will be mm -hmm. bonded in FY17 uh, that are not currently on the debt schedule. Those are factored in and we take a look at what that number is compared to the 1.9%. That's how much more we can put on the bonding schedule as we, as we run it out from fiscal year to fiscal year. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how it was. That's how it was put together. Uh, we were able to, based upon that schedule, come up with this list of recommended additions. Um, a good chunk of it is used in one-time money. Um, Ryan, will you pass that back, please? And then the rest of it is um, is uh, being recommended bonding. I'll let ta Amy talk about the, the actual items. If, or if Do you want my questions. little spiel first? I would love okay. it. Okay. So um, the, the Capital Committee um, does request from all department heads and um, committees and boards to submit a five-year um, capital plan um, to the Capital Committee. Um, total requests that the Capital Committee received this year for fiscal years 2017 to 2021 were approximately 83 million dollars of which 40 million of that related to a new dpw facility 30 million to new fire stations um, of the 83 million 36 million was for fy17 um, again in the 36 million 30 million of that was the fire stations mm -hmm. of the 36 million the capital improvement Planning Committee is recommending um, a total of two million eight hundred and twenty one thousand six hundred and sixty dollars um, of which we are requesting two million sixty three thousand four hundred and ten um, be bonded and seven hundred and fifty eight thousand two hundred and fifty dollars be funded with one-time funds such as free cash um, how the committee went about evaluating the $36 million in requests were really um, through a combination of either having a department head in or me having a conversation one-on-one -on -one with the department heads. Um, we tried to prioritize the requests. Um, one thing that, that we did do, do as Tom mentioned, that um, the committee has been trying to work on some kind of capital plan or capital strategy of how should we go about prioritizing things? How should we decide what's 
be bonded versus what would be a good item for one-time funds and and really nothing has been formally adopted nothing has been formally documented but we've had a lot of conversations about it um, we wanted to get the request into the Board of Selectmen and the Warrant Committee in a timely basis I, if you recall in prior years we're usually struggling end of February middle of February to get a request into the Board of Selectmen and this committee um, so our plan is once we have all of our recommendations put forward that we're going to jump back on the capital strategy so that going forward into next year that's all set and we really have a documented plan on what how we want to move forward but but anyways what we basically did was we used some of those ideas so um, for instance um, anything ten thousand dollars or more is con considered um, a capital item in this day and age that's not a lot of money um, that was set a long time ago um, so we talked about does the ten thousand it doesn't make sense if we have a ten thousand dollar request to bond that probably not um, if we look at the combination of what the amount of the request is along with what's the useful life of the item if it's a computer and it has a five-year life does that make sense that we bond it <coughs> probably not um, if it's something with a 20-year life and it is a higher dollar value that we probably can't afford to fund with free cash then maybe that's a good item to consider for bonding and that that's kind of how we looked at it so there were a lot of requests that we received from consolidated facilities related to um, the town buildings town facilities as well as the schools that were maybe in the ten to twenty five thousand dollar range individually um, kind of more like an improvement or repair in nature that that really we felt were was a better candidate for recommendation for free cash and those are some of the items you'll see on the list that um, what I did was I put them all together in one total so that you didn't have a five page list um, and I have um, a line item that says facility schools building and repairs and that's 63,500 and then I have something similar on the town side um, as well as some other things that we broke out like security cameras at the school that one you, strikes me as funny for for being a, um, a non bonded item well it's it's Visual technology life, related and um, the life probably of the bond would be five to seven years so by the time you ban it for two years you go out to bond you can only bond it for three and okay. then you're talking about two hundred and thirty thousand dollars over three years and it's a big hit mm -hmm. to your debt service and it has a big impact on your debt service whereas if you have free cash available it's it's a good candidate for funding okay. with one-time money so if you look at the stuff recommended for um, non-bonded they tend to be capital in nature or smaller um, dollar items now as far as the what bonded, is the urban forest that um, I have the specific details the DPW asked for um, some money for trees and um, you know the island improvements and things like that and they did receive a generous gift from the Copeland Foundation for some trees so we pared down the request and and put it in as urban forest um, and it's mainly for island improvements and do you remember do you remember they have to take a tree down yeah disease trees not for, not planting not trees plant new trees uh, it's more yeah it's maintaining the islands mm -hmm. um, and kind okay. of what they call forestry kind of things I guess well, um, Darnell has a question okay. <coughs> and at DC I had a quick question I guess is um, so I look at the DPW budgets and then I look at what we hear like you yeah, have road surface um, roadways and stuff mm -hmm. Is there a plan, even in a um, non-contingent budget inspection, where we can start really working and looking at putting something aside for real world road work to get done, as opposed to like you know, never in this well, lifetime, <laughs> you know? I, I mean, I, it, it's other than the small amount we're putting towards it. Which I, I understand, is, but I mean, there's, if there's no real we do, we're going out for over we know it's not going to be enough but if there's no real plan to or even talking about fixing the roads in Milton which 
So it death trapped a lot of cars yep. around here. Um, there's got to be some real conversation or some real speaking done to that, and I think, and it's going to have to be done on the capital side because we can't do it. It's not going to come out of an individual budget, but it also has to have a plan set up to go with it, and we really never broached that subject other than, you know, a passing comment. You know, and it, when you're looking at the, I'm looking at these numbers here, and I'm looking at, and I'm like saying, that 400000 is useless because it's really not general surfacing for one of the side streets. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, that, yeah, that's biggest, an addition of the Chapter 90 money, but, but you're, still, about, you're, you're still right. Even it's, if you look it's at so the number, yeah, it's, it's so still short. Really, yes. It's really short. And until we, as a community, or you know, really start to decide or talk about this, all we're going to get is little um, pothole fills and nothing really getting done. And I know we spoke with um, the DPW about Oh, they want to do this deep clean, you know, deep surface repair type work on it. But I'm like saying, and that's going to allow it to last for 25 years. If you can scrape the top of it and give me 10 years, <laughs> you know, and get the majority of the work around here, a good portion of the work done, and I say you're seventh on the list, and that means you're 15 years away from getting anything done, we really need to address that. I think at this point, when we start looking at these numbers and talking about these numbers, that's something that should be um, really factored in. Well, well plans should be made. First of all, it's, it's yeah, it's it's one of my pet peeves too, and I keep pounding away every time I think about it. And uh, yeah, I've I've probably said it enough times to drive you know Joe Lynch and Amory crazy that I want to plan, figure out how to do it. I don't care what it is, figure it out. You know, you two got brains, figure it out. Uh, I've come up with a couple of things uh, that that weren't doable. Um, you know, to be perfectly honest, if, if we put the, the million three that Joe Lynch says he needs in the capital budget, nothing else will get done. Everything else will have beautiful roads and no buildings. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, you know but, what saying, do you want? But, no, I mean, you know, saying, um, there's got to be a solution, but, but it's, solution it's, and it's, not, it's not in the it's operating not budget. It's not, it can't be operating budget. That's what I'm saying. It can't Why be. Why not? I, no, no, because of the, the, the total dollars that it's going to cost to get the thing done. It has to be some type of commitment that the town takes to go forward on it. Um, and, and that's I, part. Roads are a pet peeve of mine, too, but also because we discuss them every other warrant committee meeting. <laughs> Do, seriously, Tom, take a last word on this, and then I want to move on. But it's, okay. it's a serious, huge issue that, that needs to be resolved. We understand. Okay. Uh, in, in terms of roads, I won't, but other than, you know, we did put the 400 grand towards it. It's not enough, granted. Um, and, and I will still stay on top of, you know, Joe, and I will still stay on top of the town administrator to try and find a solution. Um, I mean, the solution's got to come at the state level. The state's got to put some money into infrastructure. Mm -hmm. you know, until they realize that, nothing's going to happen. Okay. Uh, but, <laughs> oh. but, but that, that aside, the, the one other thing I did want to talk about uh, in terms of capital Just joking. You know. um, is I said, you know, our, our, our fund is predicated on 1.9 percent of, um, of the tax levy. Uh, and that's what we try and keep the debt service number at. So th there's been some talk about, you know, we're, we're looking at this stormwater utility, uh, which uh, I can't take credit for it actually being my idea, but Joe Lynch brought it up, and it didn't register at first, and I started thinking, wow, I can save some money, can't it? So, uh, so you know, it, it, it certainly helps in the, um, on the uh, non-contingent budget, and, and I think it, it will help keep an override number down. Uh, on, on the contingent side, so I think it's a great idea. But there's, there's some existing debt service that's associated with stormwater, and th that's how much, about $280,000, $281,000. And, and there's been some thought of trying to move that existing uh, <coughs> debt service that was authorized by town meeting to come out of the general fund appropriation. Um, and and move it to the stormwater utility. At first glance, you say great, but then when you free up that 281, if you move that into the operating budget, now you've taken my FY17 uh, 1.9 percent debt service number down below 1.9 percent. So I'm going to get it back up there again, and it's going to have to come out of the operating budget of somebody's budget the next year. It doesn't work. 
I don't, I don't follow the last. Why don't you just spend that much money on roads? <laughs> well, if, if you wanted to spend it as one-time money, I guess, and then not spend it the next year, if you wanted to put it, but that, that doesn't help the overall picture, I guess. And, and, and it's going to, again, move that much more into, so, you know, we'd be I don't spending more. I don't, I don't follow you. If you moved the money out of debt service. Just not into an operating budget. Can't go into an operating budget. So it, it won't reduce the override. It won't, it won't do anything with respect to, it won't help anything. It's just replacing those dollars with some other one-time cost the way, dollars. The way I was thinking about it was that it would free up the ability for you to borrow more money the next year for other projects because your debt service number would be less than 1.9%. What, what am I missing there? Like your 1.9, it would go to one point whatever. Right, but, but somebody's got to pay that. In other words, if you let it fall down below the 1.9 in FY17, and if yep. you use those dollars to fund the schools, to fund the fire department, mm -hmm. okay, well now you've taken it out of my debt service schedule. So now I come to 18. And I want 1.9%. Well, last year's debt service was only 1.5%. So now you're going to have to find the money to fund my 1.9% number again. Where's it going to come from? It's going to have to come out of an operating budget. Hmm. So well, it doesn't work. That's why I like Lee Michael's idea of just throwing the difference into, into yeah. the DPW for roads. Well, yeah. if you did that, sure, that would work. But, but, yeah. but, but, but then you, you're, going to, you're going to, in total, increase everything. In other words, you're going to be telling the, uh, the rate payers for the storm water they're going to be paying more, mm -hmm. and they're not going to be paying any less over on the operating budget side because we just move that number to more capital. Well, doesn't that make sense since it's an unfunded mandate? What, why would you reduce the amount that you were planning on borrowing for your, for your bonded funded by... Why, why would you accommodate an unfunded mandate in your 1.9%? I would understand we, why are, we would have a fee. We, we've been the, doing it for the past eight or nine years. And I mean, the, but the charges are going up, right. and our roads are getting worse. So why continue to spend less and less of your 1.9%? Like I said, if, if you want to do that, I could support that. I think, though, that, you know, my concern is, is we, don't, we don't lose the whole thing. That I, 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 think the, I think you tell the rate payers. I think we've already factored this in. It's been paid for. We say any... From the time we established the stormwater utility, any new capital additions that are stormwater related go in that utility. Anything we've already incurred, we've already planned that for the operating budget. It's already in there. We'll let it stay there. Um, you know, if you wanted to do the other thing, as long as it didn't wind up in an operating budget, those reduced debt service dollars, mm -hmm. at least that wouldn't hurt me, but we'd be basically putting a little more burden on the taxpayers. I mean, if you understand that, that's fine, and, and that's We'd be okay. accepting the burden from the federal government and still doing the other things that we would have done if that burden from the federal right, government right. hadn't but, but, come. But the bottom line is it's going to cost the taxpayers more because they're going to, right. you know, they're, they're going to be... But presumably the federal government wasn't saying, okay, pay for the stormwater and don't do your roads. It was no, I just, come no, up I, for I, a way to do both, Absolutely right? agree with it. Absolutely <laughs> agree. And, and like, like I said, like I said, my, my big concern when I, when I heard... Let's put it in there is, okay, well, we're not going to take those dollars and move them into the school budget or, or the fire budget or, or, a DP, or any other operating budget because sure. then I can't replace the debt service dollars. No, I'm not thinking let's give it away. I'm thinking the capital there's dollars. lots of stuff that we're not paying for that we should be paying for. I mean, the capital, the initial capital request was... Right. I mean, just, just consider that, that that's a, if, if you wanted to say, you know, take, the, take what we're saving all over... See, anything, we, it would not impact the debt service schedule. So my debt service is going to go down. If you take it out of there, my debt service goes down for 17 and 18 with nothing to replace it with because the first new debt service, you know, anything we bring on right now won't hit until 19. Mm -hmm. uh, it, so it would have to be considered one-time money somehow, so moved in in addition to the free cash put up into uh, there. I, just be, if you're going to do it, just be very, very careful that, that it doesn't come back to bite later on. That you were saying, you know, well, how come the debt service now went up by $300,000? How are we going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. um, because it's going to. Okay. Other people must have questions. Michael. I just was 
trying to get an idea how much of an extra burden this $281,000 would be. It's a one-time shifting, and there's 8,000 households in Milton, so is that like $35 a year? Um, it's probably not a huge number. It, okay. it's, it's not a huge number. Um, I mean, it's obviously every year, you know, because th there's going to be debt service going forward every single year. Um, you know, so if you move the existing over, then then you've you've kind of said, okay, it's too. It'll probably ramp up a little bit before it levels off. Um, yeah, most I'm of this wondering is, how many cups of coffee it came to. That's, that's I mean, it's. I mean, if it, if, you, if you think that right now, I think we're talking about six hundred thousand, and I think um, will cost the average homeowner. It, it's a little more than six hundred thousand in the. Sixteen dollars a quarter. No, it was nine. It was nine on the um, on on the new schedule without the debt service in there. If you take just seventy five thousand dollars of overhead uh, of indirects plus the what was it five hundred and how much five hundred and eight. So approximately six hundred thousand dollars is about nine dollars a quarter to the uh, smaller homes, and I think it was sixteen dollars a quarter to the larger homes. Um, that's the stormwater charge. That's the stormwater charge. So if you said you're going to add another three hundred thousand to that, you're approximately adding another four four dollars and fifty cents, or uh, or eight dollars to the charge. Okay. So you're increasing it significantly percentage-wise. Yeah. Um, Dollar-wise, I mean, it's a little more than a cup of coffee, but certainly not a huge, huge number per year over a year. Per quarter, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions to Jeff? So this is a dumb question, but I'll ask it. So it, if you had the article that you presented the last meeting mm -hmm. with this fund for debt service, and you want, could the 281000 stay kind of in the debt service, instead of losing it, would this be a use for I was just curious to see, like, if this could be a use for that particular mechanism. Well, yeah, it, going forward, yes, it would be. So if, if you had that right. ability to do that. Yeah, and, and, and we certainly would. If, if we get the stormwater utility, um, most, of, most of the capital costs are improvements to the stormwater drain system. Um, and Joe Lynch budgets about 500000 a year to do so many storm drains. I mean, there's, there's, I forget how many hundreds of storm drains we have, but there's, oh, there's, there's, there's a lot. Right. Uh, and, and there's a lot of piping and everything else that goes along with it. And that infrastructure is ancient. Yeah. Um, so it, there's been an ongoing project that's about $500,000 a year. Eventually it's going to level off that, um, you know, they'll, they'll catch up with it. Uh, and there's been some other miscellaneous costs that go in there. Um, so yeah, going forward, yeah, that stuff would be in the, in the utility and, would, uh, and eventually will drop off the, um, the general fund uh, debt service schedule as the existing stuff gets paid off. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many more years there is on the existing stuff, but. I'm not sure, but were you referring to the debt stabilization yes. fund, which would be um, more like the fire, the fire stations, stations and the DPW, yeah. but not surface drains? Yes. That's yeah. what he's asking. Oh, that, okay. Yeah, that, that the surface drains would not that, that article be covered that under forward. that article, would it? No. I think that's what he's asking. No. No. Yeah, that, that would that be would more for. That would specifically be just for fire station and DPW facility. Okay. Kind of gets yeah. Ted had a question. Thank you, Amy. Okay, so can we be practical here? Just uh, I'm looking at three hundred dollars, three hundred thousand dollars of surface drains on this schedule. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to factor the, th those, will factor into the new utility. That would factor into the new utility. Yes. Okay. Knowing that that's fa going to be factored into the new utility, does that give you any more room? on this schedule, this year's appropriation schedule? Yes, it would. We could replace okay. those dollars, yes. Okay, so that's a start. You could, could you do could, that. You could turn... If, if they pass it... ...roadways into 700. Yes. Okay. Yes, we could. All right. Now... And, when, and, and keep in mind, too, we're talking... Well, first of all, we're, we're talking debt service compared to capital. Okay. You know, it, it's got a life of more than one year. Right. So you could take more than three hundred thousand dollars of of capital addition and plug it in, because you're just looking on the the annual debt service cost of that capital. Now we'd have to look at the debt schedule and see how many, what those existing, 
you know, how those things are going to come off or, or what this 300,000 looks like. But I, I, I guess all things being equal, yeah, you're probably right. You could take the 300 and Amy, is there a concern in, yeah. from the capital budget point of view, the capital committee? Or are there other things that would have been higher on your list um, rather than roads? We'd, I think we'd have to reconvene and, and discuss right. that because... But we've got to find out in February whether... Um, you know, I wouldn't want to speak on behalf of the committee without asking them that specific okay. question. So if that were to happen, I think we'd meet again okay. and revise our yeah. recommendation. All right, so that would be a question if stormwater mm -hmm. passes. Ted is... Okay, so part two on the actual mechanics. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the surface drain program you're talking about was a 10-year program that was initially set up for 500000 a year. In the last several years, or last three years, it's been underfunded. Um, <coughs> a couple of years was used for 300, 200, 300, something like that. Mm -hmm. I think this year is 300. It's used for a street sweep, sweep of one year. So in, addition, in addition to the fact that those numbers came down a bit and so that they're not 500 every year, a lot of them, even though voted at town meeting and, and authorized by town meeting, had, had not, have not been issued, to my knowledge. It, it will all be issued okay. by NFI. So, so here's the question. If the stormwater drain, if they haven't been issued, they haven't cost anybody anything yet. Correct. How much of that is out there? I believe it's probably a million it probably is. Okay. Uh, it probably is, and I, and I agree with you on that. That, that would technically that be, should, be available. That should go, the debt service generated by those bonded amounts should go to the new we utility. We can replace those. Your new correct. fund. So that amount could be replaced yes. as well. I would say yes. Yeah, okay. that it's not in the current debt service schedule, yes. All right. So that, that if, if we proceed on that basis, then you could make, more choices as Although, to hang on the, those those will be FY17 numbers though won't they they will be FY17 there will but, be interest um, but we're talking about the FY17 stormwater utility fund so the you could move some debt service from those new if, it, it if would they're not being be authorized and and if those bonds are being sold after town meeting Votes, votes for right, but you wind up on the same problem with those ones. Totally how, to, how to replace those dollars in my in my debt schedule? Because they're going to come out of my 17 and 18 debt service number, and I, I and if I put anything new in there, it's it's not going to come out of my FY 17 or 18 debt service number. I I, I agree with you. The I'm sorry, <laughs> I I we will try and retain your, your your the debt service number because it's important i think the debt service for the town ought to be a lot more than 1.9 of course it should but but if you um, make it lower then you got to get back up again i mean it just makes it that much more difficult right that's i mean that's a perfect use of the debt stabilization fund if you ask me uh and there's a actually we're told the debt debt stabilization fund can't be made to make debt service payments mm -hmm. Well, it, then it what are we, then it, we it should never contribute another dime to it. Can it. Be used for, it can be used for capital items. It can be used to pay for capital items. But it can't be used to pay for debt service. That's what we've been told. Why is it called a debt stabilization? It's a capital stabilization, capital stabilization. No, no, no. not a debt he's, stabilization. He's talking about your article. That's with the state. Oh, that, oh okay. It's I'm sorry. You're talking about the fire stations. That debt that's all over Article 37. Yeah, that's so all over it wouldn't be surface drains. No. No, I'm actually talking about our, our capital stabilization fund. I thought the purpose of the capital stabilization fund was to be able to use it in the years that you needed it for debt service. Yeah, apparently you, you, we've been told by... Um, Is that a new we, ruling? We were allowed um, to withdraw some of the premium we put in there specifically as a placeholder to pay debt service on that refunding. Right. But the, uh, we've been told by Lisa Dickinson that it cannot be used for debt service it can be used for capital oh. and debt service isn't capital but it doesn't make any sense because it makes a lot of sense to me the best no, that makes no sense at all because because if you were going to be using it for actual capital then you wouldn't be bonding it and why would you have that much money sitting in a stabilization fund to buy those capital items that you need it, so it's you, there. If you were going to be doing a big project and you could put some money away to knock down how much you had to borrow later. Right. And again, that's what we've been told. And that was from Lisa. Um, so, yeah, we could use it as one-time money to, to buy something capital. Um, and, and it could be used for 
anything capital. Um, but well, there's not a ton of money in there. I mean, a, a lot of communities, <coughs> not a lot. Some we've been doing some research on the capital planning, and some communities take a healthy percentage of their free cash and sink it into a capital fund every year, and then. If they have, you know, they decide to do one fire station and they got four million in there and it's a fifteen million dollar thing, then it's you know it's only eleven that they got to borrow, and it saves them all that interest cost right. and the other four million as well. But they do it routinely. We don't. That would be lovely. Darnell had a question. Um, yeah, my question is back here with the uh, four hundred thousand dollars in debt service. What is that? in actual dollars, borrowed dollars. Uh, when we look at that, it would depend upon it would depend on the interest rate of the bonds and the use, I mean, and the use rough, of life. I mean, not exact, but roughly a rough idea. Cause um, I, I would have to get back to you. I'd have to look at the spreadsheet and yeah, we use. I mean, if it's four hundred thousand over ten years, it's forty thousand dollars a year in principal plus three percent to four percent interest. I think the interest rates were yeah, somewhere between three and a half to huh? five. That's not four hundred thousand for debt service. That's, that's four hundred thousand of be capital borrowed. Oh, to be borrowed. Okay, yes. that's, what I'm, okay. Yes. that's yes. what I'm saying. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Yes. So, so debt, okay. That's but like, in fact, look at it this way: the the debt service is the non-excluded debt service is is about one point four million a year. Okay, and we are borrowing what about thirty million on that? No. Um, what is the outstanding debt on that? The non-excluded debt. Well, the, the, the outstanding wouldn't wouldn't matter because that's going to change all the that's time. Right. It, it, but the, the debt service will still stay up yeah. there. Because, right. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, how, how much did that you know? Does that did that finance over a period of time? I don't know the answer to that. But um. I know where you're, you're coming. At. Yeah, well, it's like if you borrow, you buy a car, and you have to have five dollars, hundred dollars a month car loan. And that is six thousand a year, but you bought a fifty thousand dollar car with that. Right. You're trying to say, how much money is this? How much stuff do I get for this this debt service that I'm paying? Is that what you're after, Darnell? No, well, that's kind okay. of what I was looking for, but I was looking for more on a, on a rough dollar number so that so. we can use a similar program. Cause my 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 roads program is similar to your fire station program, and that is there's going to be certain types of debt retiring at a certain period of time that we're already paying taxes for, so if, if we can sell the product, let's get our roads fixed or level road or whatever you want to call it and try to catch some of our retiring debt um, to pay for going forward. And we have a building pot on paying for some of these. But that's, that's in fact what we're trying to do with all the capital additions. Yeah, that, 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 that same idea is I'm trying to make sure that my debt service doesn't, doesn't go down. down. Right. That, right. that it keeps pace and goes up a little bit as the tax levy goes up. So it's. It, it, I want to lock something into, like, the same way we try to lock into fire station project and, you know, DPW yard project. I want to do something similar to roads. Right. And if we can go out. But again, if, if I put 1.9 into, <laughs> into roads, you know, it's approximately that $2 million that, you know, that we have every year. I mean, it's. No, I'm talking about selling to the town. This is, you know, earmark this as part of an, um, I hate to say overriding this year, but earmark it to make it this. We're going to do this with this money, and this is why we need to do it and just sell that to the town. Say this is what it's going for. It's for roads. It's for, you know, new trees. It's for whatever, the, for beautification of the town of Milton, keeping us um, where we like it to be. Right. It, and, and that's what I, I'm thinking of. And I think... I, and I understand what you're Everybody saying. Everybody benefits on that. I, I do understand what you're saying, it. but it, you know, if if I'm not to, if, if we're not going to go out for an override of some kind to do this, or take it out of operating budgets, we've we've got to keep the debt service number somewhat level, you know, uh, somewhat no, no, in, in, in relation I'm just to. I'm trying to answer that question. You asked so so if, if if I put 1.9 right now, we can fit two million in the debt schedule without breaking the bank. Um, so if, I, if, if 1.9 of that is roads, um, you know, that leaves, that, that leaves about 460000 for everything else. Um, that means you don't get your fire engine this year. Um, I mean, you know, what's the tra the, it, it's trade-off. 
you know. And, and the committee uh, looked, the committee spent a lot of time going through these requests. I mean, we spent a ton of time talking about all of these Speaking these of the things. time that you spent, uh, like half an hour ago, we interrupted you when you started talking <laughs> about the top of the sheet, the bonded items. Where, where are, is there anything else that you want to say about the rest of that? Because we cut you off a long, long time ago. Um, no, just just that, you know, the committee looked at all the requests in great detail. We took those kind of things in consideration. <coughs> we understand roads are important, but there's also other equipment needs, other capital needs across the town. We tried to spread it out so that, you know, we felt that the, the most important or the priority items were funded to some degree while not leaving somebody totally out of getting something that they need. We, we tried to be fair. We tried to um, um, do the best we can. But back to the roadways, for an example, if you, if you bond $400,000 in roadways, it has a 20-year life. If you short-term borrow for two years, that means you can only bond it for 18. Over the life of those 18 years, that $400,000 will cost you $571,000. To give you the perspective of why bonding may not seem like the impact is strong and one of those years alone, mm -hmm. but that's why if we have free cash, we should be looking to because use some of it. it takes up your space of available. Right. Right. Yeah, and that's a lot of money. You're paying $571,000 for $400,000 in, in roads. Just one other thing I want to talk about, and not about roads, uh, but, but about the yeah, schedule. Uh, the 125000 playground equipment, can yeah. we spend a minute or two on that? Yeah. Because that, that's, that's unique. Um, it, it, it's unique because it, it was a... It was a part-to-part -part request. It wasn't their first request. It was their second request. Um, and it really was to, to put some Band-Aids on the <coughs> playground equipment that they currently have. Mm -hmm. There is a group out there uh, that came into our last selectmen's meeting, and we've kind of known about them, that is trying to raise significant money to replace all the decrepit playground equipment that we have at Kelly and at... Um, um, Shields and um, uh, Andrews and Mary Lane Park, uh, and and the stuff is old and rusty and in rough shape right now. And that group's having a fundraiser and information session tomorrow night. Yes, they are. Uh, <coughs> yeah, and if I didn't have a selectman's meeting, I'd be there at Steel and Rye. I usually don't pass up an opportunity to go to Steel and Rye, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a selectman's meeting. Um, so we should be careful on how we use that, that 125 um mm -hmm. i think would be a better uh local match to their fundraising um but how we accomplish that is the question um so you know, the other thing they, they wanted a fund set up originally when they came to the park department they said we'll raise all the money to put the equipment all we want to make sure is it's going to be maintained mm -hmm. so you know so park department we want it we want your um guarantee that you'll put some money up to maintain the equipment, and they said we don't have the money. Um, so that that group has come back and said they, they are going to raise some money to try and establish a. Um, I believe that's what they said at our last meeting. Maintenance I was fund. Not a, a, yeah. a maintenance fund. Mm -hmm. um, well, it makes no sense for the parks for us to do anything because the equipment will be new. It won't need replacement immediately. Or no, immediately. No, but down the road it will. Down the road it will, but it will need on seven hundred fifty thousand dollars of equipment. You're all of a sudden you're going to need fifty thousand. If you try and cover it by appropriating ten thousand each year, you can't do that. You can't put it in the bank. It goes back to free cash. So all of a sudden they're going to need a chunk stabilization fund. Oh, you could. You could do something like that, but you don't need to legislate that now for six years from now. So, no, you don't. But 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 you you want to make sure it's there rather than the, having to spike into a budget in one year. Sure. So so it makes sense. Um, but th they've said they're going to try and raise that money as well. Uh, so this 125 could be a, a, a town match to their their fundraising. But when are they looking? Right. They're Absolutely. looking to build in 2018, I think. Right. right. That's the problem. That's why you, I, I don't know exactly well, how to handle it. But yeah, Amy. So I just want to be clear that the the parks department. Um, was clear that this hundred and twenty-five thousand is a very small. Yeah, it in no means replaces a whole playground at any right. of those locations. Um, their exact wording was: um, current equipment at all four playground sites needs to be upgraded and retrofitted to 2015 codes. Yeah. So this is just a very small piece that, um, in the event that this group raises money, this money can be there as long as we don't 
bond it. Right. Um, they can maybe hold off and see right. where that goes, uh, and it doesn't hurt it being there as long as it's the equipment is still safe and, and yeah. it's not a safety issue. So some that of it makes might sense need because we don't to be know used. if they're going to be able to raise this money. In they the probably, they year. probably, yeah, they big number. It's a big number. That's right. But so, yeah, so you're right. That's a good point, Amy. As long as you have the authorization, yeah. then, then you can use it and in the, any particular year. There might be some short-term needs, things that, that have to be done yep. um, for safety issues if, it, if it's a bringing some of it up to code. But I would like to think that they would at least wait and see mm -hmm. as, as much as they could. And, you know, I've had those discussions with not the Board of um, Park Commissioners directly, but through the um, Parks well, good luck to the Playground so. Committee 2.0. I yeah. support them. I think that it would be great to get some new equipment out there. Absolutely. Um, we really do need it. Other comments or questions? Yes, John. Yes, I do. I saw it. Philip, sorry. I have a friend named John Matthews, and every time I think of your name, I think John. Sorry about that, Phil. No problem. <laughs> uh, Amy, you and I have had this discussion, but why don't you share with the committee the rationale for not having the second year of the financial software? Yes, okay. So the financial software was approved, what wasn't last May? Yeah, last May town mm. meeting. Um, it was considered at that point phase one. What phase one encompasses is the um, payroll software and what we refer to as the accounting software. That's the um, accounts payable and the general ledger financial <coughs> reporting. Um, Phase one is underway. We've hit some bumps in the road um, due to some staffing issues as well as um, a, a personal issue on my side where I, I got behind um, because I was out of the office. So we made the decision that in order for, I went to Amory and, and I asked to push the go live date from November 1 to July 1 for, for many reasons. A, um, we have very few staff members here on the town and school side that are working on this project. So when we have small bumps in the road like that, um, it's detrimental to meeting the project deadlines. But as well, I felt that it's better to do the implementation right than to force and meet a deadline and have it be a failed implementation. And by the time I realized that the November 1st date wasn't going, I wasn't comfortable with that on the accounting <coughs> side of it. The November date was for the accounting side. January 1 was for the payroll side. Um, it didn't make <coughs> sense to try to squeeze it in the middle of the fiscal year at that point. So it made more sense to push it off to July 1, the start of a new fiscal year. <coughs> the auditors will come in. They'll audit the full FY16 under one financial accounting system. Won't be dealing with, well, this history is in the old system, this history is in the new. The auditor will love you for it. It was much cleaner. It helped keep the fee <coughs> where it is. Um, and it, it just, it was just something I was more comfortable in. Amory su supported me on that. So we decided to push that off to July 1. And then payroll, we were moving forward trying to meet a January 1st date. There were some personnel issues within the treasurer's office, which handles payroll, that he's down people. And it was clear um, a couple months ago that, again, I, I didn't, and he wasn't, not to put words in his mouth, comfortable with a January 1st date for the similar reasons on the financial side, but also we had an initiative that we had, we were going paperless and bi-weekly in early January. And our consultants advised us that when you convert to a new system, you want to try to minimize the variables. You don't want to go to a new software system, bi-weekly payroll, down people and paperless all at the same time. If something goes wrong, it's going to be a complete and utter disaster. So what we decided to do was Let's get, get through biweekly and paperless first. Let's stabilize that. And let's go live with payroll on April 1st. We can load the first quarter of payroll data in so that the W-2s for 2016 reflect the total gross pay and all of the withholdings. And that was something that the town treasurer's office, as well as um, the finance staff at both the schools and the town, and, and Anne-Marie were comfortable with. It makes sense 
I, again, I've, I've been through two implementations before at prior jobs, and I'd rather go to my boss and say, we're not going to meet the deadline, and, and just be honest and forthcoming with that and, and work with it and have it be a successful implementation. So with that being said, it's now postponed, so July 1 for financial and accounting, and April 1 for payroll. <coughs> When the Capital Committee was reviewing the request, phase two for the financial software is on there. But I was also honest with the committee and I said, there's no way I want to put that forth as a number one priority when I don't think we're going to spend it in FY17 because we're going to be trying to stabilize the financial switch over and going through all of that. So I, and that's, a big project. Phase two is a big project. It's the, the tax billings, it's the water and sewer billings, and it's the assessing department. And all your receivables, yeah. All your receivables. And that's a huge project that it's going to be all the same people that have been working on this first phase pro project. Again, it, I think there's, um, there's maybe eight eight of us, eight to ten of us that are working on this. That's not a lot um, of people. So would you expect phase two to be in uh, fiscal year 18? Yeah, and the hope is maybe that there will be free cash available to fund that second phase. But that's kind of where I was coming from when I, when I was speaking to the capital committee. Um, again, I knew there was other things that were being requested that probably were more of an immediate need. And that will not be detrimental pushing that off one year and letting us stabilize the payroll and stabilizing the accounting system and refreshing, getting used to that so that we can go in full force with that conversion. I think that makes good sense to me. Yeah. Anybody have a question about the, what Amy said? What happens with, uh, is Zobrail gonna support uh, what we're holding on to through 18? Yeah, or? we have not heard anything okay. otherwise. At the time frame when we were doing that, they said three to five years. And are they going to reduce their fees to us because we're dropping some of yes. their services? Mm -hmm. Once we go live with the okay. new, then we won't need support for um, payroll and the financial accounting modules. Anything else on the capital budget? I don't think so, do you? All right. Oh, everything else straightforward. Yeah. Oh, doesn't matter. You okay. Two hundred thirty thousand for security cameras for the schools, mm -hmm. and that comes on top of sixty-eight thousand the other they're, last year for upgrades. They're external cameras. The ones that they got the year or so before were inside the buildings. Right. Okay. These and are um, ones outside on the grounds. Um, and is this is this a full program for all the schools? For all the schools, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So not piecemeal. Good. No. Okay. Darnell. And then you have the um, school's phones, the phone system. Is that um, tying that phone system back, the same stuff we have here in the yes. town yes. side? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. It's just doing the other, the other yes. half of that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Which Thank you all still analog over in. there. Appreciate it. Right. Thank you. Across that. I just have uh, one more thing on the agenda to talk about schedules and whatnot. Um, but you guys are all set. Yeah. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I passed around to all the Warren committee <coughs> members, I think, um, this little chart that says fiscal year budget reviews. This is for you to take a look at later. I just wanted you to see that I was tracking who we had scheduled to come in to talk to us. If they have a dot, 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 that means they were scheduled, but it hasn't happened yet. So a lot of these will now move to the presented column uh, because we heard so many budgets from these folks tonight. Um, what is outstanding? Uh, Later this week on Wednesday, we're going to have two budgets that come in. That's my agenda here. On the 27th, we'll be back in this room at 7.30, and we're going to have Bill Ritchie and Joe Prondack come in, talk about consolidated facilities and um, inspectional services. And then next Monday, I have confirmed the cemetery. Uh, so we're going to have um, Therese come in and talk about that. And I also put out feelers to two other departments. Um, I'm waiting for David Perdios to get back to me on Parks and Rec. 
Um, I called him quite a while ago. I'm hoping that he's going to be able to present uh, next Monday as well. Um, and then I was talking with Jonathan before we started about retirement. Um, Kevin Cleary uh, is going to be having a meeting with Jonathan this Wednesday at 4 o'clock. If folks have questions about the retirement budget, would you please send them to Jonathan so that he can speak to Kevin about it? Um, Kevin is not able to come uh, when we have slots open in the near term and said maybe he could come later. So the fact that that's a question as to when we could get him in or if we would want to get him in at all um, makes me want to get our questions up front through Jonathan. So if you have, take a, take a look maybe tomorrow at the retirement budget quickly. If you have a question, please send it over to Jonathan. Ask. And if you get Park's questions, you can send them, funnel them through me. Great. And do you have a meeting on the books? No. Um, I was going to say, I started in with the parks yeah. earlier, and I got some information from them. And I don't know if you want me to just take that and go knock on their door again or hand it o over to you. But you're going to you're gonna have to deal with the DPW anyway. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to talk with you about that. I, I spoke, so on parks, if you have a question, please send it to Steve. And uh, if you get a hold of them in the next couple of days, let them know that I have emails and voicemails into them for next Monday. Um, I can knock on their door tomorrow. That would be great. I'd be happy to. Monday. <laughs> okay, I'll take the parks, you take the DPW. All right. So on DPW, I spoke with Joe Lynch today. He's available on 217 to come in here. So that's your bogey, uh, you know, as long as there's no um, inclement weather that would delay him. Uh, questions need to get to Steve uh, in time for him to have a pre-meeting with Joe. Uh, so that Joe can answer those questions for a 217 presentation. We and still need to talk about when to bring the schools back in. It's on my Probably list. the week after that 17th meeting would be good just because yeah. that's school vacation week. Yeah. So it'd probably be better to schedule them the following week. Mm -hmm. So what do you want date-wise? Can we talk about it on Wednesday? Okay. I'm, I'm uh, running a little short on All right. mental cap capacity right now. <laughs> Did you have something? Did I um, are you going to be? Do, yeah, well, I can. I can talk to Jonathan later. Okay. Um, so you'll see there who's who's left to figure out. So we're looking pretty good in terms of uh, the schedule. I was going over with Julia the other night when we need to get the warrant done. Um, Ted and I have started talking about the contingent budget, and so we're going to have a meeting coming up fairly soon where we go through the non-contingent and the contingent scenarios and the free cash and everything. Um, but just know that we're working on that. Questions? Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. Okay.